Good morning. It's nice to see all of you this morning. If you have a Bible, please turn to Proverbs chapter 2. We finally made it to Proverbs chapter 2. Um, if you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and we can get one to you. I um, mean, you can um, keep this Bible if you'd like or leave it on your seat as you leave for the service this morning and we'll um, put it back with all the others for you. Um, if you're a child and want to go through the sermon note outline that uh, Mylin makes, there are ones at each exit and go ahead and um, tally the keywords. I didn't bring one up, me, so, up with me, so I don't know what the keywords are. <laughs> Ask your parents and they can tell you if you can't read. Um, so as we go to Proverbs 2, I want to um, pose a few questions for us before we get to our text. When I was in college, both me and my wife were getting our music education degrees at the same time, and we took a lot of the same classes, and I must give her some credit that part of the reason I graduated and had a decent GPA is because she reminded me of all the assignments, projects, and deadlines that I had forgotten. And there was one case, we were both doing college ministry, and it was a Sunday night before Monday, and she asked how this project was going, and I said, that project's due tomorrow? She's like, yes, Christian, it's due tomorrow. I've been working on it for a few weeks. And she then told me, you're such a procrastinator. I responded, well, I have a lot of things to do. I have a sermon a week to prepare for youth group. I have meetings, Sunday school lessons, monthly events, even things with college ministry too. And she said, you never really seem to procrastinate on those. Or even when I was taking my, uh, some master's classes at seminary, um, she would say, should you really be reading that book when you have a book report due on this book in a week or two? You see, we all make time for the things that we value. Um, we all make time for the things that we want to do, sometimes not always the things we need to do. And that's part of what the father is going to teach the son this morning. We must focus, spend time, and make our ear attentive to wisdom, even if there are other things that we would rather do with our time and procrastinate on gaining wisdom or even see wisdom as not as necessary for the Christian life. The father is teaching and reminding his son how valuable, central, and essential the pursuit of wisdom must be in your life. This brings us then to the words of Proverbs chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 11 this morning. <clears throat> My son... If you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. Let's pray. Well, Lord, this is a tall order for us. It is only by your grace that these things can be done in our hearts and in our minds. We need your spirit, Lord, to work in us that we would desire to receive these words of wisdom and insight, but also that we would be able to apply them and accomplish them in our lives. Lord, it is not by anything within us that we can. It is only by first the sending of your son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for our sin, but also the work of the Spirit to regenerate us, that we might not have new hearts now, new affections, new desires, inclinations toward holiness and righteousness. And Lord, even still, we need your Spirit now, day by day, to empower us for the Christian life. So Lord, we humbly ask that you would do it within us, each of us individually, as a church corporately, that we might reflect your gospel good and it would be an evangelistic tool in your hands. Lord, we know that your word will not return void. It is promised that as the grass withers and the flowers fall, your word, in contrast, stands forever. And Lord, I ask that you would use your word 
to accomplish the purpose of you in our lives. It will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. And we ask that you would do that work among us. Lord, let this word preached enlighten the ignorant, awaken the careless, reclaim the wandering, establish the weak, comfort the feeble-minded, and make ready a people for their Lord. We ask this of the Father, through the Son, and by the Spirit. Amen. So Proverbs 2 begins the second speech of the Father to the Son. The first one was in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 through 19, and there the Father warned the Son to hold back his feet from the paths of the enticement of sinners. I describe this group of sinners as the gang set on their own greed, so much so they're willing to kill the innocent to fill their pockets. Then we saw an interlude where wisdom was personified as a beautiful woman who warns the scoffer, the fool, and the simple one to heed her words of judgment or that judgment will come upon them. This second speech builds on these sections and drives them home by applying the introduction of Proverbs to the Son. Remember, Proverbs 1, 1 through 7 reminded us the purpose of the book, and the Father reiterates this purpose to the Son. Now, all of Proverbs 2 is this second speech, and I was initially going to try and get it all done in one sermon, but it would have been around an hour, and I wasn't even finished. So we'll take this in two sermons. We'll have the little potluck party for me next week, and then me and Hannah's last Sunday, I'll finish Proverbs 2. Our text before us this morning functions as a giant if-then statement. There are three ifs in verses 1 through 4, thens in verses 5 through 11. This will form the, the outline of the sermon, and the ifs focus on learning, growing in, and receiving wisdom, while the thens provide for us the blessings that come with gaining wisdom, specifically covenantal and ethical righteous benefits. So this brings us then to our main point. We are first to seek wisdom before temptation so that we will be guarded by wisdom during temptation. We are to seek wisdom before temptation so that we will be guarded by wisdom during temptation. The connection is clear. We must grow in wisdom day by day before temptation strikes so that we are readily able and equipped to fight back. The Father, on behalf of God, promises that wisdom will be our guardian, our protection when temptation strikes, but we must pursue wisdom wholeheartedly in order to receive that benefit, that protection, that shield that the Lord will give us. So with that, let's go to our first main point. We are to seek wisdom before temptation. We are to seek wisdom before temptation. This brings us then to the first four verses of our text once again. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. Well, let's stop there. In these verses, the father instructs the son He implores him to seek wisdom and encourages his son to seek wisdom because it is valuable and has great benefit. This section has many connections with the first sermon that we did, Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. It seems that the father is reiterating these instructions to the son, these reasons, to show him how important it is to find and gain wisdom. In other words, the father instructs his son for the same reasons that the book of Proverbs is in our Bibles for us today. So then verses one through two is that first if statement, and it begins by describing a passive reception of wisdom and instruction. Then verses three through four uh, are a more active taking of wisdom. While there are two ifs in verses three through four, I think they function as a cohesive unit together. We'll take each one at a time. First, the first if, the passive reception of wisdom. This is verses one and two begins by an encouragement to receive these words. This is the same receive as Proverbs 1, 3, when it says to receive instruction in wise dealings in righteousness, justice, and equity. This receiving is to be done with approval, acceptance. You want to receive it. In this context, my words are the words of the Father, but these words are an application of God's word to all areas of life and are thus God's words to the child as well. 
Proverbs 1-2 says the same thing when it says that we are to understand words of insight. Words is here more a body of truth, a set of instruction. All that wisdom teaches are the words of wisdom. And verse 1 continues by imploring the son to treasure up his commands. This poetic phrasing of treasure up or hide in other translations is quite close to our concept of memorization. Consider for just a moment what we've heard so far in Proverbs. There's a story about a gang seeking to ambush someone for easy money. We've heard about Lady Wisdom calling in the streets and the marketplaces to hear her wisdom. These stories are easily remembered and impressionable upon children. When the gang does set up to ambush the innocent without cause, the, when the scoffer, the fool, and the simple one are ignoring Lady Wisdom's call, the son can remind himself of these stories, remind himself of the father's teaching, and not go down those paths of foolishness. You see, if the son hides these commandments, treasures them up, then he will accomplish the purpose of Proverbs, to know wisdom and to know her intimately. But also, there is likely an element of memorization. The ch children of Israel likely memorized the Ten Commandments. They likely memorized passages about God's name, like Exodus 34, or even the Shema of Deuteronomy 6. Well, how are we to do this? How is the son to receive words and treasure commandments? Well, the father tells him in verse 2. It expands verse 1. How can I receive the father's words? By making your ear attentive and by inclining your heart. While most of us can see the parallelism here, there's a particular nuance that we need to bring out. When someone makes their ear attentive, it's not so that they're just listening. They're listening to understand, to take in, to receive all that the teacher, in this case the father, is trying to portray. Listening to learn, understand, and grow. An active listening that soaks up every word, every phrase, as it is eternally valuable. It is listening that allows the truth to sink down into the heart. We incline our heart to understanding by setting the whole of our being to wisdom. The heart in the Old Testament refers to the center of a person. We can think of it as the, the starting place of all of our thinking, feeling, and willing. It's where everything starts. So take the whole of your being and set it to understand wisdom. These verbs, making attentive and inclining, are also used earlier in Proverbs in ch chapter 1, verse 24. There, Lady Wisdom says, because I have called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand or inclined. And then she goes on to say, no one has heeded or made themselves attentive. In other words, the father is telling the son, don't be like the scoffer. Don't be like the simple person. Don't be like the fool. Hear my words, hear Lady Wisdom's words and apply them. Make your heart inclined to her. Intently focus your life on the teachings of God's word and apply them to daily life. So we are to take the body of teaching, the commandments of the Father, by setting the whole of our being to memorize God's truths in order that we might use them and apply them and wholeheartedly seek to receive wisdom passively. Let us now look at the second if statement in verses 3 through 4. This is the active pursuit of wisdom. Verse 3 begins by saying, Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. Well, don't those words sound familiar to us? Again, he's reinforcing what Lady Wisdom has already taught. In verse 20 of chapter 1, it says that Lady Wisdom raises her voice in the markets, cries out at the head of the noisy streets. The lesson here is this. Seek Lady Wisdom with the same vigor that she calls out to you. God seeks to give us wisdom, and he passionately does so. All around us in creation, we see the evidence of God's existence, and he's calling out to us. Call out to God with the same passion. Call out to God for this, with the same zeal to find wisdom. Verse 4 continues by telling us that if we seek for it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. It's like the gold rush. We, everybody across the country was rushing to California to get this. Are we not rushing to church on Sunday morning to hear wisdom? Are we not rushing to our Bible reading every morning to study God's word? Search for it as for hidden treasure. Why? 
Because these truths matter eternally, not just temporally. Furthermore, why is this treasure hidden? Why is the word for silver here, silver that's already mined, smelted, and purified? Well, because it takes work to get wisdom. Yes, Lady Wisdom and God are calling out to us that we might gain wisdom. But at the same time, it takes great work to apply wisdom, doesn't it? It's a difficult task to go down into the mine shaft and take the pickaxe and strike and strike until you find an impure metal. Then you go up to the furnace and smelt it over and over again that the impurities might be taken out. And then you are left with something of value. And so in the same way, let us go and seek wisdom, passionately taking the truths of God's word and working on it, applying it in our own lives, and our own hearts. Many years of gleaning, meditating, and growing in God's word. Now Hebrew, like Spanish, is a gendered language, which means every noun, every pronoun has a gender. Wisdom is feminine, which probably is another reason why wisdom is personified as a woman. And with all of these obvious allusions and callbacks, I think it's legitimate to say we should translate verse 4 as, if you seek her like silver, search for her as for hidden treasure instead of it, which means we're searching for lady wisdom, seeking her truth. So to reiterate, verses 1 through 4 is that massive if statement if we take God's words, if we hide his commandments within our hearts, making our ear attentive and inclining our heart, if we call out, if we raise our voice, if we seek it and first we search for it, well, if is a big word there, isn't it? Two little letters and yet massive implication for us this morning. You see, many of us in this room might regularly confess sin, loathe our sin, even talk about ways we're trying to weed out that sin. Many of us know the words of wisdom and its benefit. Many are seeking after it like silver, but are still in the mine shaft rather than smelting and putting it to use. Maybe like the PE teacher at a school that kind of has a weight problem. You know all the right things to do, but have a hard time putting it to practice. You see, Scripture gives us many tools in our toolbox to help glean and apply wisdom. But our text gives us very specific ones. And let's look at those passive and active components once again. First, we must be passive. And what I mean is we must listen to the wisdom of others. We can't go and apply anything that we haven't first received and brought into intimate knowledge. We must first glean wisdom from those around us. Like I said earlier in this series, Wisdom applies all of God's word to all of life, so look for the marriage you want in an actual couple and glean from their wisdom. Look for the family worship you want in an actual family and learn from their years of wisdom. Look for the discipline and work ethic in someone and glean wise principles on how to apply all of God's word to all of life. Even our physical bodies are created by God for good, so find someone that knows how to take care of your, their body and learn from them. Take time to learn, grow, and develop. Even if you have a solid marriage or family, even if you feel you have strong spiritual disciplines, we all are growing. We all are seeking friendships and accountability among the members of this church help to help us grow. The elders here at this church are full of wisdom, yes, but their jobs are primarily to equip you to give wisdom to each other. You see, the wise person of Proverbs is always characterized as someone that realizes his need for wisdom. And the fool is always characterized by someone that doesn't think he needs it. There are many verses we could quote here, so allow me to quickly walk through these. Proverbs 18.15 says the wise person acquires and seeks knowledge. Proverbs 13.1 says he listens to his father's instruction and walks with the wise to increase in more wisdom. Proverbs 13.20 illustrates that I'm going to surround myself with wise people. He not only accepts commandments in Proverbs 10.8, but he also loves correction in Proverbs 9.8. I don't know of anybody, including myself, that actually loves correction, but the wise person does. 
You see, the wise person of Proverbs doesn't see these if statements as a destination, but rather a journey. The if statements can become true of us, but it's better to say that they become truer of us as we grow and apply wisdom. You see, as Lady Wisdom condemned us a few weeks ago to set aside our sinful pride and autonomy, let us continue the fight, continue to fight that urge and hear the wise counsel of other people around us, members of this church sitting in your pew. Furthermore, let us not just hear it, but seek to grow in it. Furthermore, we must also take the words of the Father and treasure up God's commandments within us. How do we treasure up God's command? Well, the drumbeat of Scripture is unanimous on this point. Killing sin starts with memorizing God's word. You may have all of the vigor in the world, but it must start here. Later in this sermon and then in the next week, we will see that memorized scripture, wisdom within our hearts, is a protection. It is a shield. It is a deliverance from temptation. Jesus battled temptation with scripture. And if God the Son incarnate needs to do it, then this simple worm needs to as well. The psalmist writes in Psalm 119, I have hidden your word in my heart, same word in our text, that I might not sin against you. Memorized scripture led the writer of Psalm 119 to say, I will not sin if scripture is within my heart. The way we battle temptation and apply the word of the scriptures is to know them. Whenever I did accountability groups or talks with the youth students about sin, my advice was always the same. Memorize two or three verses directly related to your sin struggle and quote them in times of distress and weakness. Start even by memorizing a few good hymns. Many of the truths that we sing day by day, week by week in church help us to remind ourselves of the gospel and therefore fight sin. If we truly meant some of the words that we sing, sin would hardly be a struggle. Lastly, we see the father telling his child to do this in the context of family worship. So memorize scripture with your children. Sing hymns with them. Hide God's word in their heart and your own. The father is instructing his child and encouraging him to hide word, his word. First, model it yourself as the father has done. Second, we must be active. Be vigorous in applying wisdom to all areas of your life. Take a good look at the knowledge you've acquired through your passive reception and be active in pursuing godliness. Scripture says that we are to discipline ourselves. Be active in killing sin. Well, what are some practical ways we can do this? Well, as you read Scripture, meditate on it, memorize it, use that first to fuel the way you pray. If I were attempting to memorize Proverbs 2, for example, it'd be very easy for me to glean things to pray. Lord, I pray that I would take your word into my heart more fully. I confess I don't always seek your wisdom, but rely on my own strength and ingenuity. I ask you would cause my heart to want your wisdom in this way. Pray that you would believe God's promises more fully, know the gospel more truly, feel the joys of the new covenant blessings more and more. There is much to pray for in the scriptures we read and memorize. Furthermore, when you find yourself in a tempting situation, use the memorized scripture as a means to help you. The Holy Spirit works with God's word. Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit exists to remind us of the teachings of Jesus, which are all across the pages of scripture. Ephesians six seventeen tells us that the sword of the spirit is the word of God, the offensive to fight back against temptation. So quote scripture to yourself. When you're tempted to doubt God's love, recite Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. You could sing how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. When you're tempted to skip family devotions for a night, re recite Deuteronomy 6, 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you walk by the way and when you sit down and you rise. You shall bind them 
on your hand and write them on the doorpost of your house. When you're tempted to yell at your wife in anger, recite to yourself Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that you may wash her with the power of the word. Or if you're tempted to be anxious, recite to yourself Philippians 4.7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Sing pardon for sin, and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. When you're tempted to feel guilty over your sin, recite Romans 8.1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or sing the great hymn. No condemnation, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. When you feel downcast and depressed, recite Psalm 20, 42, 11. Why are you downcast, my, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Hope in God. When you're overwhelmed by the present life, feel no hope. Recite Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, set your minds on things that are above. Seek him. If you're tempted with pride, recite Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was with God, would not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Sing, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count as loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, safe in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that, I char that charm me most, I sacrifice them in his blood. That's how you use memorized scripture. Apply it every day. So this if is a very important if. Learn wisdom from others. Apply wisdom to your own life by having memorized scripture for every occasion. We can always remember that the spirit of God works because of Christ's work on the cross for us to make these things true. In other words, we passively learn wisdom and Jesus' promise that the spirit will remind us of these teachings will come true. We actively pursue to apply wisdom, and Scripture tells us that the grace of God will continue to give us that desire and power to pursue him. Pray that these things might be done in your life, that it is only by the power of God that these things are possible. So if we do this, if we take in God's word passively, if we pursue it actively, there's great benefit. You see, when we do this, the Lord will protect us and guard us in temptation it's not all dependent upon us. This is a promise from God. So let's now look at verses five through eight. We will be guarded by wisdom during temptation. So that now we will be guarded by wisdom during temptation. This is verse five going down to verse 11. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. So now we move to the two then statements. The ifs correspond to the thens as obvious when we passively take in wisdom, when we actively apply it, we receive the benefits and blessings from God. These benefits and blessings aren't necessarily material possessions, but understanding that comes from God's revelation that will protect and guard his people from sin and temptation. Looking at verses 5 through 11, we see this remarkable pattern. Throughout your Old Testament and Hebrew literature, they often take concepts recursively, repeating the same kind of thing over and over again. And that helps us to see things from one perspective and then go at it from another perspective, like a stereo system, as it were. 
That's the case here, where verses 5 through 8 go across the topic one time, and then verse 9 through 11 go through the topic a second time. Well, what's the topic? The benefits of imbibing wisdom. So verse 5 through 8 give us the first benefit, covenant relationship with God. Verse 5 tells us, we'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, a covenant relationship. Then verses 6 through 7 Give us the grounding. God gives us his revelation. He gives us his wisdom. He tells it to us. The result, verse 8, guarding the paths of justice, watching over the way of his saints. Guarding your path, your way, as you walk in this life. Then he repeats the same thing, verses 9 through 11, this time through the perspective of, um, excuse me, walking in righteousness and holiness. Verse 9, then you will understand righteousness, justice, and equity. And then verse 10 goes through that same thing. How are we going to get this? For wisdom will come into your heart. Wisdom is going to give it to you. Wisdom is going to plant itself in you in such a way that you will love knowledge. It will be pleasant to you. The result, verse 11, discretion will watch over you. There's an ethical protection, a reputation here. So we'll go through verses 5 through 8, focusing on the covenant fellowship we have with God, and then verses 9 through 11, focusing on our righteousness and holiness. And I hope you see the intimate connection here. Once we have gospel fellowship with God, then the holiness will come. So let's then begin in verse 5. It begins with the familiar phrase, the fear of the Lord. Here it is connected to finding the knowledge of God and shows parallel concepts or ideas. In other words, understanding the fear of the Lord is the heart posture that must come before finding the knowledge of God. We've said before that the fear of the Lord is the humble disposition of the heart, setting aside our autonomy and pride while admitting our need for wisdom from God. The fear of the Lord is to turn aside our self-assuredness and to turn to God as the source of all wisdom we need. Turn from your slavery to self and turn to slavery to God. This refers then to a personal covenant relationship with God. Considering our context, as members of the new covenant, this is none other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to set aside our sinful autonomy, pride, and selfishness and humbly admit our need for a savior this morning. In admitting our need and trusting in Christ, we are set free from sin and condemnation and are forgiven and brought into the loving arms of our Savior. And that can be true for you this morning. If you're not a believer, all of these benefits of wisdom will never become true of you unless you first turn from your sin and profess faith in Christ. Because we're then in that covenant relationship with God, he pours out wisdom like a fountain in verse 6. The Lord's giving it generously. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. It's his speech, his word. As God speaks, it's recorded in scripture for us. So all of God's word has benefit to it in the sense of wisdom. So as we're implanting God's word in our heart and memorizing it, that wisdom is going to become more true of us. His mouth is going to bring out knowledge and understanding within us. Remember, Proverbs is not isolated from the rest of the Old Testament. It's simply taking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, whatever, and applying it to everyday life. It's not separate from it at all. Verse 7 begins to unpack for us then how wisdom can be beneficial to us. He stores up wisdom for the upright or those who have sound judgment. They have good sense. They aptly see when temptation is coming. As we memorize God's word and treasure it in our hearts, God stores up wisdom through the reminding and empowering work of Christian sanctification. When God stores up wisdom for us, he becomes that shield. That leads us to verse 8. He guards the paths of justice and watches over the ways of your saints. Isn't that such a great promise? That we don't have to fear sin and temptation. That God will guard us. He will protect first his justice, but also that justice would be done in the world around us. The picture here is, well, let me say it this way. In our next sermon on Proverbs 2 in two weeks, verses 12 through the end of the chapter, verse 22, really just applies this. 
first to the evil man of verse 12, and then to the forbidden woman of verse 16. And that, that's where we're going with this. But the focus here is the son, the wise person, walking along the path of justice and walking along the path while temptation is throwing its spears, but the Lord is a shield guarding and protecting us. Temptation catches our eye, yes, and does tempt, captivate our hearts. But God's word is so implanted in us that we can stay on the path to eternal life. It's like the great story, Pilgrim's Progress. As Christian makes his way to the celestial city, he's tempted to go off the path by many foes that cause him to doubt God's promises. God promises to guard these paths and watch over our way. And over and over again, when Christian is down in the bog, in the miry clay, someone comes to save him. When he's fighting Apollyon, the dragon, someone comes to help him. And God promises the same for us. Before we move on, just consider these glorious promises we now have in Christ. When we turn to God and find covenant fellowship with him, he will give us wisdom. He will give us knowledge. He will pour forth his word into our minds and hearts. He will store up sound wisdom and bestow it when we need it. He will be our shield, the guardian of our path, the watcher of our way. So be encouraged this morning. God is watching over you, and he promises to never leave you or forsake you. He's guarding you as we implant his word. This reminds me of the words of Ephesians 1, 16 and 17. I do not cease to give thanks for you, Ephesian saints, remembering you in my pray prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Pray that God would give you that same revelation and wisdom. Now we move to the next then statement, verses 9 through 11. It follows the same path as we saw before, but the focus now is on holiness, righteousness, and ethical living. Verse 9, same thing, begins with the benefits. Verse 10 tells us that ethical knowledge and wisdom will enter our heart. And then verse 11 is the result of protection, watching over us and guarding us. So if we passively receive God's word, treasure it in our hearts, actively apply it, raise our voice and search for it, then we will receive righteousness, justice, and equity. This trio was given to us already in Proverbs 1.3. The purpose of Proverbs was to help receive instruction and in wise dealings in righteousness, justice, and equity. In other words, there's a wise application of God's word to our ethical lives, our godly living, our moral skill, prudence, seeing the pit before we dance along its banks. This is seeing danger before it strikes. Verse 10 tells us that the reason we can live ethical lives is because wisdom has become pleasant to us. Notice that it does not say, you make wisdom pleasant for yourself. Wisdom becomes pleasant to you. How? Well, on the one hand, God makes it pleasant for us. But as we continue to use it and apply it, we seek to enjoy it. One of my favorite illustrations of this is um, with one of my cousins. I was babysitting him at one point, and I decided that it would be fun to get him to try strawberry milk for the first time. And he was incredibly hesitant because it looks gross, it's pink. I don't know about this. And I was recording him to send to his mom. And over and over again, he would get really close and not do it. Get really close and not do it. And finally, he took the smallest little sip and said he liked it. As I was sending the video to his mom, I looked up and he had finished the whole glass. <laughs> Similarly, once we get the taste of memorized scripture, the taste of benefits of wisdom, begin to enjoy and delight in it more and more, then we will delight in it and enjoy it and ravish it. But th there will be periods of discouragement and a need for discipline, but it will become more beneficial and we will delight in wisdom more and more. Finally, verse 11 concludes that we will be protected, guarded from temptation. Our character, our reputation, our moral living are protected because God has implanted his wisdom in, uh, in us and the ifs are true of us. We're in covenant fellowship, relationship with God, and wisdom has come into our hearts. We'll be able to fight back against temptation. So by way of brief application this morning, we can see a few sides to our lives as Christians. 
the covenant relationship and the righteous fruit. The theological term that this refers to is sanctification, growing and conforming into the image of Christ, walking the Christian life. Sanctification is based on these two sides. On the one hand, we have gospel-centered covenant blessings that are always true of us, regardless of what we do. What Jesus has done is the focus, our justification. We are legally declared as right with God, and we have the blessings of his righteousness. He forgives and gifts. But we're also called to take that salvation and bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It is to become holy as God is holy. It's because we are now declared holy. Furthermore, it's not as if God is done working in us now that we're justified. God now works with his spirit to sanctify us as we work out this salvation. Remember the great words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Do you see the tension in this thought there? The grace of God is working within him, but he's working harder than anybody else because the grace of God is working in him, because he's working harder than anybody else. It is both God's work within us in the past and the present and our work that makes us holy. So to put this in a clear and succinct way, We can think of this as a triangle or a triad of sanctification. We can first look at the objective gospel realities that are presently true. Remind us that we are forgiven, that we are adopted into God's family, that we are a treasured possession, God's inheritance, that he loves us and cares for us, and that in the gospel there is no condemnation and all of our sins are forgiven. That motivates us to live the Christian life. Second, we can pray that the Spirit will continue to make these true objective realities more true and evident in our lives. God the Father declares us to be holy in Christ, and the Spirit of God promises to make us holy in Christ. Remember that by prayer, you can ask the Lord to be more sanctified. Lastly, we are also called to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, that we can also work harder than any of them as the grace of God works within us. So as we close this morning... Looking at the first half of this lecture of the Father to the Son, we see many rich promises here for us, but we also need to kick in the pants to get to work. When I was uh, a child, my brothers and I were really into the Christian rap scene of the 2010s, and there was one song we listened to that had a sermon clip. Then I wasn't Calvinist or anything, but it was a John Piper clip, and he said in this clip, I hear so many Christians murmuring about their imperfections, their failures, their addictions, and their shortcomings. But I see so little war. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Why am I this way? And then he says, make war. I think there's much truth in that. Our accountability groups can quickly turn into, well, I struggle with this sin, and I know I shouldn't do it, and I don't like doing it. And it turns into complaining about sin's existence rather than a fight to destroy it. Many of us in this room have heard John Owen's famous quote, be killing sin or it will be killing you. It's great. But we forget that killing sin is like killing dandelions. They pop up everywhere. And as you kill one, more take its place. So let's take the quote in its full context. Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it whilst you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Make this your daily task, dear church. There's a reason that the word of God is called the bread of life. Take it in every day. Let the killing of sin be your active pursuit as the Lord empowers us until he returns. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, this is a tall task as I said and prayed for us before, that there is no way that we can do this of our own strength. But Lord, you don't leave us helpless. You give us your spirit. Lord, work within us this week as we seek to memorize your word and implant it in our hearts. We ask this in the name of your son. Amen. I'd invite you to stand this morning as we continue with our worship and uh, sing a song. As the song goes and we sing, the ushers are going to pass out the elements of the Lord's Supper. If you're not a Christian here with us this morning, we ask you to let the cup and the cracker pass before you. 
as this is a sign for those that are in the new covenant, have received the blessings of the Spirit, and now we take to continue to fuel us and remind us of what God, God has done in Christ. So um, Jeff Newman is going to come up after the song is over and lead us as we